Hello, everyone, and welcome to our final session of the Google Earth Engine for Land Monitoring Application Series. Uh, my name is Zach Bankson, and I'm based out of the NASA Ames Research Center in California, along with my colleagues who are joining me for this training, um, Juan Torres Perez and Amber McCullum. So before we get started with today's session, I just want to cover some logistical reminders that you might already be familiar with. Uh, this series includes two, sorry, three two-hour sessions, as mentioned, and today is the final session of the series. And after each live session, recordings are posted to the training webpage. Uh, so if you didn't have the opportunity to join every single one of the sessions, um, you can definitely watch the recordings um, on our website, and those are also posted on YouTube for your later viewing. Um, and there's one Google Form homework due on July 14th for this series. And I've provided the link to the web page here on the slide. And uh, we'll have a Q&A session at the end of today's webinar. Uh, but if we're not able to get to your question or if you have any questions after the session is over, uh, definitely please feel free to email us at the addresses we've provided here. And here's just a, a quick reminder of the topics we've covered in the first two sessions of the series. Um, in session one, we went over the basics of Google Earth Engine, um, calculating a set of vegetation indices in the JavaScript API. And then we took a quick look at the available Python API in Google Colab for anyone who might be interested in using Python to engage with Google Earth Engine. And in session two, we covered the basics of land classification and accuracy assessment. Um, and then completed a supervised land classification of Cumberland County, Maine um, in the Google Earth Engine JavaScript API. So for today, uh, we'll go over the basics of time series analysis and landscape change detection, um, and then complete an activity using tools in Google Earth Engine uh, to examine changes in vegetation cover um, over a number of years. And I mentioned our names earlier, um, but here's just some pictures of the RSET Eco team so that you can put uh, faces to names. Okay, so here's just a, a quick overview of what we'll be covering today. Uh, first, I'll go through some slides to make sure we're all on the same page uh, with at least the basics of time series and change detection analysis. And we'll also cover some methods that we can use in Google Earth Engine uh, to complete these types of analysis. And then we'll transition to the GEE code editor, and I'll walk you all through a basic time series and change detection activity, examining vegetation change uh, over a large landscape. And this activity will include Landsat data retrieval, imagery prep, calculation of a vegetation index across an image collection um, over a series of years, um, change detection using visual analysis, and uh, image differencing and visual analysis of the, and data visualization. And as usual, uh, we'll wrap up with a Q&A session so we can answer any questions that you might have. All right, so let's get started with our time series analysis and change detection overview. Um, kind of similar to the land classification and accuracy assessment uh, session, we won't be completing an exhaustive overview today uh, since both of these topics are, are rather extensive, um, but we'll focus our efforts on what you need to know for this session. Um, and I'll also point you in the direction of past RSET trainings where you can learn more about time series and change detection. All right, so as many of you are likely aware, the use of multiple satellite images over time allows us to identify various types of change on the ground. And when these changes happen over a series of days, months, or years, uh, the use of many different images allows us to view the progression of these changes. So this is particularly useful for things like gradual changes, like a decrease in forest health due to mountain pine beetle infestation, for example. Um, and there's also the advantage of having a long record of satellite imagery from sensors uh, like Landsat and MODIS, with Landsat representing 40 plus years of data um, and MODIS providing uh, 20 plus years of data. And time series analysis has become more prevalent in recent years uh, with the advent of cloud computing like Google Earth Engine um, and improved processing. 
And the use of Google Earth Engine for time series analysis is particularly prevalent uh, given that large data records uh, like the Landsat and MODIS data sets I just mentioned are already available within the GEE data catalog. So time series analysis looks at landscape change as a dynamic process occurring over a number of months, years, and, and so on. Mapping land over these time scales allows us to better understand things like trends in land cover change and patterns in vegetation growth. And some common uses for time series analysis that you're likely familiar with are the identification of urban expansion, uh, mapping deforestation, um, and monitoring post-fire conditions. And we have an example of this last use here on the slide. Uh, remote sensing scientists have been monitoring post-fire recovery in the Yellowstone National Park for uh, decades after a series of lightning and human-caused fires consumed uh, vast stretches of the park. And here you can see uh, the use of a normalized difference vegetation index to track post-fire vegetation recovery um, in the area over the course of 30 years. And with this example, it's really important to recognize uh, that the necessary time scale for your own analysis uh, will be different depending on the type of disturbance um, or change that you're interested in. And in this case, uh, a long time series is necessary to capture the recovery of the landscape. Now let's talk about some of the imagery selection criteria for completing your own time series analysis. Um, images should be collected around the same time of day to reduce differences in sun angle. And ideally, images from different years should be within the same month or season to avoid seasonal and phenological differences in imagery. Uh, for example, if you choose an image in the dry season and an image in the rainy season, um, assuming you can find one that is cloud free, um, then you'll see differences in vegetation greenness uh, due to different precipitation amounts rather than actual change in land cover. So similar to this, even if you choose images from the same time of year, you need to be aware of different annual precipitation amounts for those particular years. So if one year experienced extreme drought and one year experienced normal rainfall, um, you'll be seeing differences in, in vegetation and, and land cover type uh, due to the differences in rainfall. So those are just some important caveats and, and ways of thinking that you'll want to keep in mind as we continue to discuss time series. And we also have an example here of NDVI anomalies uh, in the southwestern US. And these anomalies uh, compare yearly NDVI to a long-term average across years to detect variations in the time series, um, noting that uh, certain years have particularly low or unhealthy vegetation. And we'll talk more about this type of analysis a little bit later on. There are a variety of different types of time series analysis, uh, which we'll briefly cover. We can view annual or seasonal trends, such as patterns in vegetation phenology. Um, and we can also view gradual changes, uh, like I mentioned earlier. Um, this is things like vegetation degradation uh, resulting from, say, a pine beetle infestation or disease. And then we can also examine abrupt changes, um, which is something like a forest fire, a, a large disturbance that creates, time, uh, creates change very quickly. And anomalies can provide us with information about how landscapes may vary from average conditions, uh, like drought-related impacts seen only in particular years. So we can generate uh, environmental descriptors and parameters as well uh, to evaluate changes in things like uh, species habitats. So we'll go over each of these different types of uh, time series analysis over the, the next few slides. So in our first type of time series analysis, we can use a yearly time step to evaluate annual trends occurring over a number of years. Uh, now this type of analysis focuses on the use of years as a unit for describing change and variation. And an annual time series can include as many years as are available or as many years as you'd like to include. And I use this phrasing uh, because typically the, the limiting factor in a time series analysis is in fact data availability. 
And mapping of annual trends can be useful for assessing land cover changes over long time periods. And here's a, a really good example of this on the slide um, of land use, land cover change. Uh, it's a time series completed for uh, the Yangtze River estuary region. And as you can see, this relatively lengthy time series um, has maps that are made from 1985 to 2016. Um, and these maps do a really great job of monitoring the growth of impervious surface um, over the entire time series in the region. Um, and this is usually something that we associate with human development. So as you can see, this is a little bit more of a gradual change um, that we're able to observe over a number of years. So time series like this provides us with a lot of information about uh, how land cover type has changed over a number of decades. So in our next type of time series analysis, uh, we're concerned with seasonal trends. These trends are often driven by environmental factors like temperature or precipitation. And seasonal time series uh, can describe variation within a year and also identify differences in seasonal patterns between years. So in the example here on the right, you can see changes in seasonal snow cover with modus imagery uh, from the winter to summer months in the Himalayas. And these maps display the percentage of time that a pixel was snow covered during each season. And that's using that modus data uh, from 2000 to 2008. And it will likely come as no surprise to you uh, that most of the snow cover occurs in winter months, as you can see on the map at the top. So a time series analysis like this is really good at detecting those changes that you could see within a year that end up being uh, due to seasonal uh, factors. So when we think about landscape change, uh, we usually frame this change as either gradual or abrupt. And gradual changes are those that occur over a longer period of time, uh, like over the course of months or years, uh, while abrupt changes take place quickly and are often marked by a distinct change um, in the land surface. So we've provided some examples of both change types. Um, gradual changes can be due to things like land degradation, insect infestation, uh, disease, and uh, forced recovery from a disturbance event. And abrupt changes to the land surface can be due to things like wildfires, deforestation, or rapid urban development. So the figure on the right shows a time series plot of NDVI for a site in Yellowstone National Park from our previous example. And the plot shows an abrupt decrease in vegetation due to fire events, and then a gradual increase in vegetation as regrowth and recovery take place after the fire. And we'll make a time series line graph similar to this uh, during our activity in the JavaScript API. This is also a really good example of how change might work in your landscape. Sometimes you don't just have gradual change or abrupt change. Um, an abrupt change can then prompt gradual change, like in this case where uh, the abrupt change in land cover is due to fire, and then we see gradual changes due to vegetation regrowth afterward. So our next type of change is determined through the identification of anomalies. And anomalies are essentially the difference from average conditions. And in a time series, uh, a long-term average is established by compiling data from the entire time series um, over the total number of, of dates or years that are available within that time series. So once a data set of average conditions is calculated, and analysts can difference images from individual years with the average uh, to determine how much a single year might vary from that mean. And there are a couple of different ways to do this, but that's generally kind of our first example of assessing an anomaly, which is really just comparing um, a distinct year to that long-term mean. So an example of this is uh, the image you can see on the slide uh, from the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations. Um, which indicates NDVI anomalies from March 2019. Um, and NDVI values uh, from this year were compared to a long-term average of, of those NDVI, NDVI values over the entire time series of data available uh, to that organization. So you can see in the legend uh, that different colors correspond to varying degrees of difference between 2019 um, and the long-term average. So something like this could be used to identify a drought and how that might affect current and future food security. 
So we essentially use these anomalies as a way to examine how different a single year is from uh, the compilation of all of the average data from all of the data points that we have within our date uh, within our time series. So satellite images uh, can also be used to generate maps of environmental descriptors and parameters. And these descriptors can act as a kind of uh, proxy for management needs, uh, like those shown here related to wildlife habitat health. And in, in this example, dynamic habitat indices were created from MODIS data collected from 2003 to 2014 uh, to provide information about vegetation health, along with other habitat metrics like productivity, uh, perennial cover, and the degree of vegetation seasonality. And these uh, dynamic habitat indices, or DHIs, uh, capture seasonal variations in energy that species can use in the form of food uh, that are useful metrics in the understanding of bird species richness. So using time series analysis in this way uh, can be an excellent uh, method for characterizing those environmental parameters uh, kind of most important to your study system or area. So I hope this, this discussion has given you some perspectives on the usefulness of time series analysis for land monitoring. Uh, but as you know, we're really interested in exploring ways that we can do this in Google Earth Engine. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, GEE maintains a huge catalog of data uh, spanning a number of years um, with global coverage. So you can take advantage of this data accessibility uh, to complete time series analysis at daily, monthly, yearly time steps, time steps, and kind of so on, depending on your own needs. So using the Google Earth Engine API, uh, we're able to filter and compile these data sets according to our chosen specifications and use this data uh, to assess land cover, uh, calculate environmental parameters, and ultimately visualize and communicate uh, the change you identify over time. So here we have an example of NDVI. Uh, plotted in Google Earth Engine over three different landscape types uh, from 2010 to 2019. And plotting a time series like this um, is a, a useful method to identify seasonal and yearly fluctuations in vegetation presence and greenness. Um, and we'll show you a simplified version of this in our activity. Um, but that's all to say that plots like this and, and other types of data visualizations, um, some of which we'll go over in Google Earth Engine, are a really great way to kind of display this time series analysis in a way that's uh, meaningful and easily communicated uh, to whatever audience you might be interested in working with. Now, I thought this was worth mentioning. Um, if any of you are familiar with the Landsat-based detection of trends in distribution and recovery algorithm, or Landtrender, um, as it's most commonly referred to, and, and you've probably heard it, um, as Landtrender more than that, that spelling out of the acronym. Um, but you might want to take a look at its implementation in GEE. Uh, Landtrender temporarily segments a time series of images by extracting the spectral trajectories of change over time. And it's worth noting that the use of Landtrender in GEE uh, simplifies a lot of the pre-processing steps and can really make implementation of this algorithm easier compared to other platforms. I um, mean, we won't be going more in depth on Landtrender during this session, uh, but I definitely encourage you to take a look at the link I've provided on the slide. This will take you to kind of an intro tutorial of implementing Landtrender in uh, Google Earth Engine. Okay. So now let's transition to our overview of change detection. Uh, change in satellite imagery generally refers to the conversion of the landscape from one dominant feature type to another. And examples of that include similar disturbance factors uh, that we covered earlier, and that's things like changes in tree cover due to um, abrupt changes uh, like wildfires or land clearing, um, urbanization and land degradation due to overgrazing, um, Many of the things that we, we also covered for the time series analysis section, since these two um, types of analysis are so um, intertwined. So with satellite imagery, we can answer questions like, where and when has change taken place? How much and what kind of change has occurred? 
and what are the cycles and trends of change. So the example here on the slide shows the urban expansion of Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia. And you'll notice that many instances of change detection feature images that are relatively far apart on the time series, uh, like how in this case, the imagery used is from 2001 to 2014. And it's usually a little bit easier to note change this way, uh, which really makes sense uh, since more opportunity for change has occurred in the time between the images um, since they're further apart on that time series. So to further characterize change detection, we group changes into three major types. The first is directional change, like urban development. Uh, the second is cyclic change, uh, like seasonal plant phenology. Um, and the last is multi-directional change, uh, things like deforestation and regeneration. And there are also several broad categories of change that you can detect with satellite imagery. Um, and those include a uh, change in shape or size of land cover type patches, um, something like urbanization analysis, for example, like we saw in the previous slide is, is a really good example of this, as well as slow changes in cover type, um, which are more difficult to detect than abrupt changes, um, like those due to wildfire or deforestation. And we can also detect uh, slow changes in the condition of a single cover type. Uh, like say forest degradation due to um, insects and disease like we've mentioned before. And this type of change detection can be easy or difficult kind of depending on the extent of damage uh, to that single cover type. And lastly, um, we can also look at changes in the timing and extent of seasonal processes uh, such as decreased rainfall and its effects on vegetation. All right, so the way we detect change in the landscape uh, using satellite imagery is by detecting changes in the spectral values of pixels. And pixels will have different values before and after changes have occurred. Uh, we went into this in a little bit more detail, um, covering spectral signatures in the last session. Uh, so hopefully you remember uh, kind of what the plot on the right is. Um, but in this example, we see that healthy vegetation uh, represented by the green line has high reflectance in the near infrared, but low reflectance in the shortwave infrared. Uh, but burned areas are the opposite with low reflectance in the near infrared and higher reflectance in the shortwave infrared. And so this is just a, an example of, of our use of spectral signatures to complete this, this change detection time series analysis. So you can use that information um, specifically in this case, uh, not only to detect burn areas, uh, but detect the severity of burns as well. So if we take that uh, knowledge of the spectral information further, uh, we can use the spectral properties of a cover type, uh, like burned vegetation in this case, um, to detect it and compare it to conditions in previous time periods. So in this example, we use the normalized burn ratio or NBR to identify burned areas. So NBR uses remote sensing data at the near infrared and shortwave infrared uh, to identify burned land surface. And so if we calculate the NBR uh, before a fire and then after a fire, we can difference the images to detect land surface changes uh, due to burning. And you can see here on the slide, uh, the differenced NBR or DNBR shows those areas uh, changed by fire. And we can ultimately use this uh, to assess burn severity. So we'll go further into um, image differencing like this um, a little bit further later on, but I just wanted to go ahead and give you a, a quick kind of applied example of how change detection works. Um, and extra points if you remember NBR from our fire series. So there are a series of common goals when it comes to change detection. Uh, we complete change detection analysis to both identify the location of change um, as well as the type of change. And we also try our best to quantify change, um, providing some sort of area uh, metric or frequency of change metric. And we want to assess the results of our change detection analysis in order to hypothesize about why this change may have occurred. And so that said, it's much easier to locate and quantify change 
um, than it is to identify the cause of change. So here are some suggestions for completing change detection analysis. Um, you'll want a multi-temporal data set. Um, that's basically to say you want a data set that has a sufficient time series for detecting change. And when selecting data, each image within your time series should ideally come from the same sensor um, and have the same spatial resolution. An imagery should also ideally uh, be collected at similar times of day, uh, days of the year and seasons. And you'll also want cloud-free data uh, that's hopefully gone through radiometric and atmospheric correction. And it's important to keep these factors in mind uh, because you need to minimize changes due to data characteristics that you're not interested in, um, things like cloud cover or aerosol interference, um, so that you can identify the changes that you are interested in. So basically, you want to control for any factors that might influence the accuracy of your change detection. And you'll notice that a lot of these, these suggestions are similar to time series analysis. Uh, time series analysis and change detection have a lot of the same uh, data requirements, and you'll, you'll kind of note that they're kind of inextricably linked in this case. All right, so it's also important to consider uh, the class uh, uh, of the change you're attempting to identify. So if you're looking at between class changes, uh, you're typically evaluating the change of one land class to another, uh, basically asking the question, has the pixel changed and what has it changed to? Um, and an example of this is uh, conversion of forests to agricultural lands. Uh, but within class changes, on the other hand, um, allow us to ask the question, how much and in what direction has a pixel changed? So this basically means that you're assessing change within a class, uh, like change in a vegetation index value. And in our GEE exercise, uh, we'll be looking at within class change of a vegetation index uh, to assess vegetation degradation. And so while this isn't the same as change detection between classes, we assume that the degradation of vegetation or reduction um, or increase in our vegetation index values um, results from cover change due to things like human development, uh, drought, and agriculture. So there are many ways to detect change in imagery, uh, but for our purposes today, we'll only be looking at two of these methods. Uh, the first is visual analysis, um, which is a, a pretty simple process of comparing satellite imagery at different time steps. Um, a rather extreme example of this um, here on the slide is um, an abrupt landscape disturbance uh, like the Mount St. Helens eruption um, that you can see here in the time series displayed. And these uh, types of changes are often obvious enough uh, to be delineated purely by looking at, at, say, something like true color imagery. Image differencing, however, uh, uses raster calculation methods uh, to difference pixel values um, from different times or from average conditions. And we'll go over that a little bit further um, later on. So we'll go ahead and just finish up our discussion of visual analysis on this slide. Uh, visual analysis usually is usually um, completed by just a, a simple visual comparison, um, hand digitization, um, and uh, the use of band combinations to identify change. So like I mentioned before, um, this is often best for large changes, uh, like the shape or size of large uh, cover type patches. And it's definitely not as good for subtle changes um, for things like land degradation. So this method also doesn't necessarily take advantage of the spectral response of cover types in the same way that something like image differencing might. Um, and this example here shows the hand digitization of deforestation patches in Peru. And for our GEE activity, uh, we'll calculate our vegetation index um, and kind of simply compare maps from different years to, to visualize change. And that'll be kind of our, our type of visual analysis that we complete during the session. Okay, so let's talk about the other method that we're interested in. Um, the image differencing method works by simply taking a, a single band from two different dates of imagery and subtracting one from the other. 
resulting in a difference or a change image uh, that highlights areas of change. Um, and this method can also be used to difference a single year and an average of the time series uh, to examine how one year might differ from a long-term average. And this is kind of uh, our uh, pseudo-anomaly analysis in this case. So this can help you assess where a single year may fall in terms of uh, the mean condition and whether or not you're seeing normal variation or true change. So the change image consists of positive and negative values where change has occurred and zero values where no change has occurred. So the advantage to this approach is that it can detect subtle changes, um, but sometimes it can be a little bit difficult to interpret. Here's an example breakdown of how image differencing uh, works on the pixel level uh, by simply taking a single band from two different dates of imagery and subtracting one from the other, resulting in a change image. And as you can see, differencing takes place pixel by pixel, making change detection uh, delineation more specific. And the change image consists of, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, positive and negative values uh, where change has occurred and zero values where no change has occurred. So image differencing can be particularly useful for examining change in continuous indices. Um, and we're, we're gonna do some of this um, within our GE activity. So here's a quick example of image differencing using a normalized difference water index or NDWI. You can see the true color images here from uh, 2018 and 2019 on the right. And uh, the NDWI is calculated using green and near infrared bands uh, for both of those dates. Um, and then the images are differenced using that new NDWI band. So the differenced image highlights flooding in blues and greens on the differenced image, showing us just how different uh, water inundation was between these two dates. So I'm not gonna sh show you much more of this uh, because as I mentioned before, we're gonna be visualizing a lot of this um, during our activity. Um, and that's kind of where we're gonna wrap up um, our, our overview sections today. So I, I know that was a bit of a crash course though, um, really just to get us all on the same page for uh, the activity today. Um, so I've provided links to relevant past trainings here. Um, if you're interested in learning more about time series analysis and change detection, uh, definitely take a look at our investigating time series of satellite imagery um, and change detection for land cover mapping training. Uh, both are available on our website. Um, and I've also included the link to our remote sensing for mangroves in support of the UN Sustainable Development Goals training. Um, I provided this last time too, uh, but I just wanted to, to reiterate that this training um, is a great option uh, to look at if you're interested in data visualization in GEE. And um, in this case, it's particularly re relevant to uh, time series and change detection. And just like last time, uh, I wanted to point you in the direction of uh, a few links on the GE developers website. Um, there are a number of guides, tutorials, and example scripts on there that you might find useful for your own work. Um, and I've included links specifically for the image collection charts, uh, time series animation, um, land trender, in case you're interested in implementing that in GEE, um, as well as the mathematical operators pages, um, which are featured heavily um, in our image differencing and anomaly maps that we're going to create. So I've also provided the link to the full list of guides and tutorials made available by de the developers. Um, and this can be a really great place to, to kind of get started with GEE or develop some of the knowledge that you've learned within this series. Okay, so we're finished with the overview. Um, and we're gonna go ahead and transition over to the JavaScript API for our activity in GEE. Uh, you wanna use the link um, on this slide um, to follow along in the JavaScript API. Um, so you can either grab that from uh, the slides, PD, or the PDF of slides, um, or I believe it's gonna be posted in the chat if it hasn't been already. So if you weren't able to sign up for a Google Earth Engine account for whatever reason, no worries. Um, you can definitely follow along on screen, um, but if you want to explore the activities uh, from the series later, uh, you'll need to make an account.
Okay, so I'll just go ahead and move over to screen mirroring. All right, so hopefully you were all able to grab that link from the, the PDF slides um, or from the chat so that you can follow along. I um, mean, you just plug that URL right into your browser. I um, mean, if you already have a Google Earth Engine account, you're already logged in, um, you should be all good to go um, with the code for today. Um, so we're just going to go over a couple of the different parts of uh, Google Earth Engine and particularly this interface uh, with the JavaScript API. Um, you'll probably remember a lot of this information um, because we, we went over a quick overview in session one and then and Brittany uh, went over um, an overview of, of everything in session two as well. But we'll just go ahead and um, look at everything one more time. All right. Oh my God. There we go. Okay. Awesome, so you'll notice within um, the interface, you have a couple of different windows. Um, the first being uh, the one with the tab scripts, docs, and assets here. And for scripts, you can kind of see my, my messy series of, of folders and scripts. This is where you're gonna organize um, all of your different codes. Um, and so this is basically like a file directory format where you can organize all of the codes that you're working on. Um, it'll keep track of your imports, um, and, and it's just a really good place to, to keep track of everything. Um, it's also where you can save your code so that you can share it later, um, things like that. You can also access uh, repositories from this window as well, um, those that are shared with you um, to get scripts from other people working in GEE. So docs is basically, um, where we can filter for methods if you're looking for a certain function that you might be interested in. Um, for example, say you wanted to clip um, a map to a specific bounds, so you could type in clip here. And it basically just goes through some of the, the functions that you can use for your own purposes. Um, and this, in this case, it clips to an image, uh, it clips an image to a geometry or feature. So um, if you're, really kind of stumped on what function to use or you want to even go through a list of what's available in Google Earth Engine, um, definitely take a look at this docs tab. And then we also have our assets tab, um, which basically just shows all of the assets that we have uploaded. In my case, this is a lot of shape files that I've used in the past, um, just for my own purposes. Um, and you can also upload assets um, that includes your own imagery um, in GeoTIFF format um, or or a couple of other formats as well. I um, mean, you can also upload um, table information, um, things like shape files, uh, CSV files of your own data. Okay. And you'll remember uh, this main code editor window, um, which basically has all of the code that you'll be working on down here, um, where we edit the code, as well as any imports that are within your code here up top. Um, and this is things like uh, geometries that we use to um, define our study areas or do clips or establish points within the code. And you'll note that in the section two, you can uh, save your code. Um, here's the run button up here for when we wanna run our code. Um, and you can also reset that, um, which basically just brings it back to the beginning. Um, and also some information about apps. And so this get link button is particularly useful for any collaboration that you wanna do. That's basically the button that I just pressed to get this link for you all. Um, it just provides a link of a, a snapshot of the code as is um, so that you can share with anyone you might be interested in working with. All right. And the next window over here, um, we have our inspector tab, um, which basically allows us to just click anywhere on um, a map that we say have added to uh, the map viewer um, to see any metadata and information about the values of that layer. Um, we also have the console, um, which we use to print information about metadata. Um, this is where our line graph is gonna show up today. Um, it's where um, our, the, the time series gift that we create is gonna be displayed as well. And then we also have our task tab and you can see a, a variety of export functions uh, attempting to work for um, our session today. Um, you can see here, I finally got this one to work for us. Um, and this is basically um, any task that you've coded into your code editor um, that needs to be externally confirmed. So in this case, when I was 
uh, completing an export of a map. Um, I coded that into the code editor and then it popped up here and then I was able to click run on the side and we'll, we'll show this in more depth um, as we go through the activity. All right, and you're all probably still familiar with uh, the map viewer. This is just where we view um, all of the work that we're doing uh, within the code editor. We can add map layers here to visualize them. Uh, we can explore the different layers that we calculate. Um, and we can also establish different geometries here um, with different buttons. So we could say, say we wanted to create a new layer. Um, that could either be a point where we could establish a point here. Um, we can establish a line um, if, that's, if that's something that you find useful. Uh, polygons as well, um, as well as a uh, rectangle. And um, that's actually something that I used to establish our study area today. So we'll take a look, a look at that a little bit later. Okay. Actually, I'm just going to trash that. Yep. And so that's just me deleting a, a, a geometry that I created to show you this example. Um, we also have uh, our search bar, which is really useful for searching data sets. Um, for example, say you're interested in using Sentinel imagery. Oops, let's fix that Sentinel imagery. Um, you can see all of the different Sentinel data types here. So you may be interested in working with SAR data. Um, you can click on that and it'll provide you with all of the information from the data catalog um, to decide whether or not this is data you, you might wanna use. It has band information and it gives you information about the image properties. Um, and then you can also kind of just copy and paste this snippet right here um, if you'd like to import the collection into your code editor. Okay. All right. So we'll go ahead and get started. This is gonna work uh, the same as it did last time. So everything is currently commented out um, in the code editor and we're just gonna uncomment as we go through uh, each line of the code. So as a reminder, you can either backspace these flash marks to uncomment code, um, or something that's probably a little bit easier for you would be to highlight code. So we'll just go ahead and highlight what's this lines five and six. So if you wanna highlight that um, on a Windows machine, you can use control slash to uncomment. Um, I have a Mac, so I'm going to use command slash. And so you just want to use that control slash or command slash to uncomment everything that you've highlighted. And if you do that again, it just recomments the code. All right, so we'll go ahead and leave that uncommented. And then we'll go ahead and get started with our import of Landsat imagery. So in this first variable that we're creating here in line five, um, we're establishing the variable um, image collection um, for our uses of a, a collection of imagery um, and the work that we're going to be doing. Um, and we just say uh, variable image collection equals um, this function here, uh, ee dot image collection, which then calls um, this Landsat data set of surface reflectance that we're interested in. And to give you some context about where this comes from, we'll just do a quick copy paste search. You don't need to do this long with me. You can just look on the screen. So we'll just search that data set. We'll go ahead and click on it. And we can see uh, USGS land surface reflectance tier one. And so we got this information here. Um, and we'll come back to this briefly um, when we look at some of the band information that we're interested in. Okay. So in this, this first variable establishment where, where we're looking at creating image collection. And so as I mentioned, uh, what we're doing for that is calling in this Landsat surface reflectance data set, um, and then we're using the dot filter bounds uh, function on line six um, to filter the bounds to our study area. So study area um, is just a geometry that you can see up here up top of our study area. Um, it's a polygon that I've created um, just so that we can spatially filter um, our data and, and create some maps. And so I'll just show you this real quick. I used just the, the rectangle draw function right here. And we'll just take a look at our study area. It's basically just a rectangle around a uh, region of interest. In this case, it's on the border of uh, Brazil and Bolivia. Um, and so we're gonna be looking at um, some changes in vegetation in the Amazon. 
So you can kind of create those polygons for whatever um, region of interest you might have. Um, you can also filter to a shape file like we did in the last session, if that's something that is of interest to you. All right. So we'll go ahead and uncomment lines 8 through 20. And so this is where we're going to do some filtering uh, for quality of pixels um, using a function. You might remember this uh, similar method from uh, last session. We're using kind of the same uh, cloud masking technique um, with the surface reflectance data. So just to give you a little bit more context, we're using uh, QA pixels within this data set. So we can take a look at the bands. So surface reflectance data um, is processed uh, to level two. And with that processing um, comes uh, a series of bands that are used for uh, quality control. And so we'll look here. We have a lot of reflectance bands that you might already be familiar with um, that are just different uh, portions of the electromagnetic spectrum. And then we have this pixel QA band, um, which we use to mask out things like uh, cloud shadow, cloud, um, those are the things we're most interested in in this case. Um, so you can see here in pixel QA uh, bit mask, you have uh, different numbered bits uh, corresponding to the type of um, quality interference. So we're interested in bits three for cloud shadow and bit five for cloud. And so we're gonna use these parts of the, the pixel QA band um, to filter our imagery for clouds and cloud shadow. Okay. So to do this, um, we'll start in line eight. So we create a function uh, called mask L8SR, um, and we're creating that mask for image collection, which we've, we've just established up here. And so what we're gonna do is first create a variable called shadow cloud bit mask, and that's here in line nine. And so for this, uh, we use the bitwise shift left operator, um, and we select pixels um, that have a pixel QA value of three, as you can see here. And three corresponds to pixels that have cloud shadow in them. Um, and then we kind of do the same thing uh, for clouds bit mask, um, looking specifically at clouds. So we use that shift operator again uh, to select pixels uh, with a five, which in this case corresponds to uh, pixels with clouds in them. So we're basically just selecting those pixels that have cloud shadow in them with cloud shadow bit mask and uh, clouds within them, which is clouds bit mask. And once we establish those variables, um, we create a variable QA, um, which just selects the band within our image collection that we'll be working in, which is that pixel QA band that we we looked at um, in the data catalog. All right, so we create another variable, uh, mask, which uses uh, that variable QA um, to use the function uh, bitwise and, basically selecting um, the bit information that we've uh, collected for cloud shadow in a cloud shadow, cloud shadow bit mask, um, and uh, putting that equal to zero, um, which will take them out of our imagery. Um, and we do the same thing um, with this and function, doing exactly the same process for um, our clouds bit mask. So what we're doing here by equaling these to zero is essentially taking them out of our imagery, um, providing us with images that have clear conditions and should hopefully not be influenced uh, by cloud shadow or clouds. And so within the function, um, we update our mask with this new mask information. Um, and then we return the mask image uh, by 10,000, uh, dividing by 10,000 uh, to scale um, this uh, for reflectance. And then we select the bands that we're interested in. We've just gone ahead and selected um, a number of useful bands within uh, the Landsat data, some of which we, we won't be using for this activity. Um, and then we copy the properties 
um, from our image collection so that we can prefer, preserve this uh, system time start property that we'll use to filter by time. So hopefully that was a useful uh, overview of what we're doing in lines eight through 20. Um, so with that function that we've established, that mask L8SR, we're then able to use that to filter clouds and Cloud Shadow from our image collection, which is really useful for maintaining um, high quality calculations and transformations of that data. All right, so we'll go ahead and move on to the next section. So you want to uncomment lines 25 through, oops, let's right. there we go. Lines, what was that? Line 25 through 38. And just as a reminder, that's command slash or control slash. And so in this step of the code, uh, we're making a list of years um, so that we can filter the collection uh, based off of a uh, specific year time scale. And so for our purposes, we're interested in, say, summer imagery. Um, so we'll be filtering um, each year of Landsat data um from uh 2014 to 2020 since we're only working with landsat 8 um and our hope is to just pick out the summer months of that and basically reduce that um to a median or take the median of all of those pixels um over that time period so our first step in doing this on line 25 is establishing the variable step list um, which uses this list.sequence function um to essentially um create a list that includes all of the years that we're interested in working with. So that's 2014 to 2020. I mean, you'll note that uh, the Landsat 8 uh, time series starts in 2013, um, but we went ahead and just capped it at uh, those seven years of uh, Landsat 8 data. So we'll create another variable, which will allow us to filter, filter the image collection that we established uh, earlier on here at the beginning of our code. So in line 27, uh, we use var filter collection, and we make that equal to step list, which is the list that we created here um, to call years 2014 to 2020. And then we use that information to map a function across our collection. And so in this case, we're creating a function that's gonna do a lot of things for us. Um, it's gonna filter uh, data seasonally, um, providing us with a uh, median image of uh, Landsat data for summer months um, within each of our target years. And so we'll take a closer look at this function here. And so the function itself is filtering um, for start date and end date, which we establish here. Um, and those are just dates from a uh, year, month, day. And in our case, we're not interested in necessarily establishing a specific year since we're already filtering for those with a uh, step list and year and so we're interested in just getting all of the data from may 1st to september 15th um, for each year of landsat data that we're interested in and so we establish these variables start date and end date oops start date and end date um, to do this and then we create another variable uh, that's composite i which then uses some of these uh, variables that we've established in the function um, to then apply some of this information to our image collection so we note within the entire establishment of uh, variable composite i um, we're calling in the image collection and we're filtering by date we established start date and end date up here in lines 28 and 29, uh, but in line 30, um, we're doing that filter date function, start date, end date. We're also applying uh, with the dot map function, our mask L8SR, which is, if you remember our mask from earlier, which is gonna mask out uh, cloud shadow and uh, clouds themselves within all of the Landsat pixels that we're using. And so once that masking is complete, we're going to have the function reduce each of the image collections. So that's all of the imagery that we have 
um, from May 1st to September 15th. Um, in each of the years, um, we're going to have the function calculate a median um, value for all of that imagery, which provides us with this nice median image um, from a single season uh, within a year. And then we're going to make sure to use the dot set function, um, mentioning the system time start property and start date um, so that we're able to filter our image collection uh, using this time information. And then we're going to use the return function on composite i to um, apply this function. Awesome. So in line 37, uh, we then establish uh, the variable yearly composites, um, which is equal to uh, the image collection, um, filter collection. And so you'll note here, we establish that variable here, and that's basically just our image collection filtered based off of the parameters um, that we've given it here in this filter function um, from lines 27 to 35. And so these yearly composites are uh, masked for clouds and cloud shadow. Um, they're seasonal median images um, for summer in years from 2014 to 2020. And we've also made sure to preserve some of the properties that we'll need to use to filter those images from the image collection later on. And we just have a print function here on line 38, which is gonna give us a quick look at uh, the composites that we created. So you're gonna wanna go ahead and click, well, actually, let me make sure your console tab is open. Let's see, and then go ahead and run your imagery, or sorry, run your code. All right, so let's take a quick look at this. So this is just what we printed here in line 38. Um, it basically lists it as an image collection. So we have seven elements, which is what we were looking for. That's uh, seven median images um, from 2014 to 2020, only selecting for uh, summer months. And you'll note all of these uh, images are sorted by um, the index property, which is just from zero to six. And you can see that within each of these images, there are nine bands. And those are just all of the bands that are kind of available to us uh, readily within Landsat. And if there's any other uh, metadata that you might be interested in, you can take a look here. And you can also see that when you're, when you're working with the bands, uh, it's, uh, these are how you refer to them in the code. So if you wanna work with band one, band two, band three, this is how you would include that within your code. So this is just a quick check to make sure that our filtering and compositing worked well. Um, and so with that, we have successfully created a series of median composites um, for the years of interest that we have, which are 2014 to 2020. Okay, so within this next step, we'll go ahead and look at line 40. And we're going to be adding an enhanced vegetation index function, um, and we're going to apply it across our image collection. Um, you might remember uh, the enhanced vegetation index from our uh, first GEE activity. Um, the enhanced vegetation index is uh, kind of just another vegetation index that you can use um, in addition to something like NDVI. The reason that we're using it in this case um, is that it's usually a little bit better at working in densely vegetated areas, like somewhere um, in, like, say, uh, forested areas in the Amazon, like we'll be working with. And so uh, I've gone ahead and included the EVI calculation here. And so you'll note there's a number of constants here, but the band information that the EVI is using is uh, the near infrared, the red, um, as well as the blue bands within this calculation. <clears throat> All right, so let's go ahead and uncomment lines 42 oops let me highlight that better lines 42 to 51 so we start by establishing a function uh, for calculating our evi um, which is basically what this function is doing right here so we create uh, the variable evi image uh, so that we can select for the bands that we're interested in using um, for this calculation 
So image dot select is used um, to call the bands that are already available within the collection. And we're interested in bands five, four, and two, um, which in this case are the near infrared, red, and blue. And then we go ahead and name them um, according to uh, the information that we have here in our equation. And then once we've established that, we create another variable and that we're just gonna go ahead and name EVI image again um, because we won't necessarily need to use this variable again. So we'll just go ahead and rename it. And then we'll establish an expression based off of this band information that we've already collected um, so that we can calculate our EVI. So you'll note here that when you're using the dot expression function, um, you can write out that uh, equation in a way that's a, a lot less complicated than some of the mathematical operators in Google Earth Engine. So here in line 45, you can see um, that we have the equation written out um, similar to how it is in uh, line 41. Um, this is just an easier way to complete some of your calculations. Um, I, I personally prefer using expressions like this when I'm doing um, more complicated raster calculations just because um, some of the mathematical operators can get like a little confusing and, and this way just ends up being a little bit more clear uh, to anyone who might be looking at your code. All right, so in order for Google Earth Engine to know which bands to use uh, for this calculation, um, we're establishing essentially all of the variables within um, our equation here. We're saying that near in the expression um, equals our selected band um, of uh, near infrared um, that we established earlier on in the function in line 43. And then we're just doing the same for red and blue as well. And then we're renaming this function EVI uh, because this function is gonna map over all of our yearly composites. And then returning um, that as image.addbands EVI. So this is what's going to add an EVI band uh, to each of our yearly composites across uh, the image collection. And so we'll go ahead and uncomment lines 53 to, oops, oh, oops, there we go. We'll go ahead and uncomment lines 53 to 55. And so as I mentioned, this is just where we're going to um, add the function, the EVI function that we created. I'm gonna apply it to our, our yearly composites image collection. And so what this function is doing is essentially adding that EVI band. I'm mean, making sure all of the appropriate, or it's actually adding the um, EVI uh, calculations to the band that we added. Awesome. And so we'll go ahead and uncomment line 57. And you know you can you can also do this by just uh, backspacing on those slashes. And we're just going to do a simple print function um, of yearly composites after we've added um, that EVI band. Um, just to take a, a look at uh, what that looks like. So we'll go ahead and click Run. Awesome. So we'll take a look at some of this information here. Let's see. Type features. So there's still um, seven elements within the, the image collection, uh, but you'll note that instead of nine bands like we had previously, um, we now have 10 bands. And this includes um, the EVI band added here at the end with the index value nine. And so the, the nice thing about Google Earth Engine is we don't necessarily have to refer to this band um, by that index value of nine. We can just use its list name to call it in the future. All right, so I'll just collapse that. Okay. So go ahead and move on to the next section. Oh, whoops. So we're going to want to uncomment line 60. And so with this line, we're establishing the variable EVI collection, and we're having that equal to uh, the selected band within yearly composites of EVI. So essentially what we're doing with this is making an image collection called EVI collection um, that includes only the EVI band for each of the yearly composites. And that'll just make um, it easier for us to work with that EVI band um, as we continue through the code. Okay. 
So we'll go ahead and uncomment lines 63 to 67. Oh, whoops, actually no, that's 64 to 67. You can just go ahead and add uh, the comment uh, slashes back in there. Just type two slashes into 63, uh, line 63 to get that out of there. And so in line 64, um, this is our first example of essentially just establishing a variable, and in this case var uh, y 2014 for year 2014, um, that will allow us to pull out just the 2014 image from the EVI collection um, so that we can uh, create a map of just the, the simple EVI calculated um, for 2014. So you'll see here we're, we're using the filter date function um, with the EVI collection to just filter for dates in 2014. There's only one image uh, within the collection that has uh, 2014 in it, but we go ahead and select for that first image. Um, which is just the only 2014 image that we have, and then we clip that to our study area. And so it's important to note that in this EVI collection, we, we only have that EVI band. So when we go to map this, it's just going to uh, go ahead and show us the EVI. So with that, I've got quite a bit of lines for this to add every map to the map viewer. So you can go ahead and uncomment lines 68 to 82. Um, and that gets us our filtering of the EVI collection for dates from 2015 uh, to 2018. I'm doing the same thing, selecting that, that image per year from the image collection, clipping to the study area, like you can see here on line 82. And then we're just gonna finish up this process for uh, 2019 and 2020. So we'll go ahead and uncomment uh, lines 84 to 92. Remember that's control slash or command slash to uncomment. All right. And so now that we have all of our, we have variables uh, kind of picking out the EVI uh, band from each of our years. Um, let's take a look um, at one of those years. We'll go ahead and take a look at Y20, which is just our 2020 imagery. Go ahead and click run. All right, so we have that as an image here, and we'll take a look at 2020 composite image. Let's see, so as we note, there's only one band. So this was a successful um, kind of uh, pluck out of our EVI collection, taking only um, a single year so that we can then map those individually. Awesome. Great, so I'll go ahead and collapse that. And then we're, this next step is going to be adding maps to our map viewer um, of each of the EVI calculations per year. So we'll go ahead and uncomment lines 94 to 102. And in line 94, we're just creating a variable that's going to uh, set the parameters for our mapping. So with that, we create EVI params just for uh, the parameters that we're interested in using to display the data. So you have a min and a max value, as well as a palette. We're keeping the palette very simple um, this time around um, with just white and green as our palette colors. And then to add all of the map layers, um, I'm sure there's a, a different looped way you could do this, but I think for our purposes um, of just understanding how this works, you essentially use the same function for each year. <clears throat> So we're using the map.addLayer function. We're saying we want to take the EVI band uh, from Y 2014, and then we want to display that map using the EVI params a variable that we, we talked about here in line 94. And then we're basically just naming that layer um, with this section here. So as you can see, I've made it uh, 2014 to 2020 EVI. And so let's go ahead and run this. Now this is quite a bit of processing to do, so don't, don't be wary if it takes a little while. It's actually loading pretty quickly, which is nice. And so these are all of our EVI maps uh, per year uh, populating here in the map viewer. So we'll go ahead and let those load fully. And so you can see here um, in the map viewer that displays in this layers tab, and you can click on or off each of the layers. Uh, the one at the top is the one that's going to uh, be shown on your screen. 
Um, so as we click through these, we'll work our way down to 2014, and we'll get a look at that 2014 EBI. So we're gonna do a quick zoom in, and we're gonna take a little bit closer of a look at our EVI results. This is kind of a, a simple version of the, the visual analysis that we mentioned before, but we'll go ahead and just keep 2014, and as we click on new years, we can see locations of change, we can see areas that have more or less vegetation for whatever reason. And you can see that a lot of that change isn't necessarily abrupt. A lot of it is gradual. As we kind of click through each of these images to look at them. And you can do some of this exploration on your own, um, looking at each of the, the maps that we've added, um, just to, to see how the years vary from one another. And then we'll go ahead and finish off with 2020. So I'm gonna, for, for the purposes of, of seeing that change from 2014 to 2020, I'm just gonna click off 2019, or sorry, 2015 through 2019. And here with the transparency slider, um, we can make the 2020 layer more transparent. And it takes a little bit to load sometimes, but we can see here, the change isn't necessarily abrupt but we note different areas where we have seen change. So you can see that with something like this, with a visual analysis of change, we do notice changes kind of throughout um, the image. We can, we can compare different years visually, but this isn't necessarily where we would wanna stop. This is really good data visualization. We're taking a time series of maps um, and just displaying EVI over a, a time series, um, which can be really great for looking at change on a year to year basis. Um, but it's not necessarily the best for identifying a uh, change between distinct dates or um, changes from an average EVI, um, things like that. But since we have all of these maps, um, I want to go ahead and show you how to export a map to Drive. Um, and any map that you export will at default export to, um, or export as a TIFF file, um, which is something that's pretty easy to use in most GIS platforms. And something that's pretty appropriate for EVI as well. So in this case, we only have one band and it exists on a continuous um, value scale. So that's something that is, is really easy to work with in TIFF format and just kind of import to whatever GIS you might want to. And so we're gonna go ahead and uncomment lines 105 through 107. And we're gonna establish the variable Y 2014 section. So you'll notice <laughs> that in my tasks window, I had a couple of my exports um, just not work. They were just a little too large. Um, there are other ways that you can um, change uh, the properties of the image. You can make them lower resolution so they export better. Um, but I wanted to show you just a way of you know, segmenting um, one of your data layers so that you can preserve that, that 30 meter pixel resolution that you get from uh, Landsat. So when we establish this variable uh, Y 2014 section in line 105, and we make that equal to our EVI collection filtered for 2014. That's just me reestablishing that, um, that Y2014 value for our own purposes um, so that we can use it to just export a section of the full data layer. And so we'll uncomment lines 109 through 114. And here you can see the export function is being used to export uh, the image to drive and so we select the image here in line 110, and sorry, 110. Um, we give it a description, which is basically just what it's going to name it. And we give it a scale, which we've selected as 30 um, for uh, the 30 meter resolution of Landsat pixels. Um, and then we set the max pixels. This is actually kind of a max pixel value that you can, uh, that uh, GE will export as. So if you have anything higher than this, um, you'll likely have an export issue. But let's go ahead and click run to run that. And you'll see uh, the export doesn't pop up in the console, it pops up in tasks. And you can go ahead and click run once you're ready for that export to happen. So I've already, I've already done this once. Um, it, this, in this case, with the function we used, it'll export to your uh, Google Drive. And so you can have your task name, which we already established in the code. This is where you can change um, any resolution that you might want to. 
So say you have a really large Landsat based map at 30 meter resolution, um, you can always adjust the resolution here um, if you want to export the whole thing and you and you don't care about that that loss of resolution. But we've established that 30 meter pixel um, here for Landsat, and you can also change that to where you would like. Uh, to export it here. We've selected drive already, so we're just going to leave that. But you can always put that in uh, cloud storage, or you can actually just export it as an Earth Engine asset automatically. You can establish your drive folder here, um, and you can also rename that file if you would like to. Um, and then you just have to click Run uh, to go ahead and export that image. And so for that, oh, I should have probably mentioned this earlier, <laughs> but for that, we're just using the clip section. So if you'll see here in line 107, I've just clipped uh, this 2014 EVI layer um, to this geometry section that you can see here on the map viewer. Um, I really just did this uh, so that we could get a successful export. So once you run this export, it should be successful since the image area is small enough. It'll still be at 30 meter pixels. I um, mean, you can kind of explore that exported TIFF file um, yourself in, say, something like ArcGIS or QGIS uh, at your own leisure. Okay, go ahead and turn this geometry off. All right, so the next thing that we want to do, um, something that we mentioned um, uh, within our presentation, is uh, create a line chart to display EVI time series for selected points. And then we're going to display that chart in the console over here on the right of the screen. So go ahead and uncomment lines 118 to 124. So here we're establishing the variable chart, and then we're using uh, the ui.chart.image.series function. And essentially what this is doing is uh, creating a function that will allow us to display a chart of the image over a time series um, according to whatever image collection we select. So to filter this, I've, I've gone ahead and put our image collection here in line 119 um, as the EVI selection, or sorry, EVI collection, uh, selecting for that EVI band because we're interested in a time series of the enhanced vegetation index in line 20. Uh, we establish the region as ROI, and this is just a point that I have put onto the map using this, this point tool right here. It's in my geometry imports. It should be in yours, too. You can turn it on here. ROI is just a point that I've selected um, within our study area that we would like to examine uh, the, the time series of. And so this will give us um, a single pixel perspective on change about our selected point. So we're selecting the scale at 30 because we're using Landsat data. And then using the set options function to just title that chart uh, 0.1 EVI over time. And then when we go to view that chart um, in line 124, we'll just print the chart, uh, the, the variable that we've established up here in line 118, and that will show us um, a time series of EVI at that single pixel. So I'm going to go ahead and recommend that you uncomment lines. 126 to 132 as well. This is just the exact same code, but for a different point. I wanted to show you a couple of different uh, pixels with this, um, and that's with our ROI2, and that geometry can be seen. We might have to zoom out. Oh, there we go. And that geometry can be seen uh, lower within the study area. So we have one point in uh, Brazil and another in Bolivia. So once you've uncommented that lines 126 to 132, we can go ahead and click Run. All right. Which will give us a time series at each of the points that we've established. So you can see here we have uh, the EDI value on the y-axis and then our, our time scale on uh, the x-axis. So you'll note that EVI changes over time at this pixel, um, and you can see that time scale going from 2014 to 2020. So you'll note that in this case, 
we see um, a decrease in EVI, which we would expect to represent some sort of vegetation degradation or change in uh, development or cover type. In point two, we have a different curve, um, which has some less abrupt changes in EVI over time, um, represented here by a curve that's not quite as abrupt as the one above. And this is really to just show you how you can use Google Earth Engine to kind of inspect a time series of, of any parameter that you're interested in um, in Google Earth Engine. And you can create these plots uh, that help you visualize that change over time. And then you can also click that uh, button right there on each of the charts um, to blow that up into a different um, window. And then you can also download it as a CSV, SVG, um, or even download it as a PNG if you're just interested in displaying the graph. So it's a really easy way to go ahead and uh, show some of your time series information. Awesome. All right. And so we'll go ahead and move on to something that's a, that's a little more um, fun. We're gonna create a time series GIF of the EVI maps. Uh, this can be a really engaging way to display some of your data. Um, I can tell you how many times uh, partners that we've worked with have been interested in, in these really simple visualizations that just uh, provide us with like a dynamic way of looking at some of the changes that we see over time. Um, so we'll go ahead and uncomment lines 137 through 145. <clears throat> Oops. Actually, and make sure you comment out line 139. I just wanna uncomment everything. Um, but we'll go ahead and look back at line 137. So we'll establish the variable text, um, which is essentially us just using the require function to call in um, a package created by um, another scientist um, uh, who makes all of his uh, packages available um, on GitHub. And we're essentially calling in this package so that we can use it to uh, visualize um, the dates on each of our GIF images. So we call in this package um, so that we're able um, to provide text with each of the, the different images that go into the GIF. So we'll have kind of a counter that goes through 2014 to 2020 using this package. So the first thing we want to do in line 40 is to create a year property. And this property is what we're going to use to display that text on the screen. And so we create the variable year names in line 140. And then we use that list function again to create a list of years um, that we would like to display in our GIF image. And then we create another variable uh, called EVI with year, which is basically us just mapping a function over the EVI collection that pulls in these year titles so that they can be a property of each of the uh, images within EVI collection. So basically what this function is doing is using dot map to map the function over every image within the EVI collection, assigning it to um, a specific year so that we can filter for that and use it for the text in our GIF. So go ahead and uncomment line 147, and we'll go ahead and run this. Whoops. There we go. We'll scroll below our charts. So we're going to look at the EVI with year collection, you'll note it still has seven elements, which is all seven of our EVI band images. But then you'll note if we look further in at the properties, we now have this year property, which is listed as 2020. And that just is, is useful for us in filtering the data. And like I said, the, the package that we're using requires this type of property um, to name it um, a specific year on the screen. And so we'll go on to defining our GIF visualization uh, parameters. So go ahead and uncomment lines 150 through 155. And we're going to establish a, a series of parameters using the variable uh, GIF params. And basically what we're doing with this is filtering for a region. Um, basically, uh, the bounds of the GIF will exist within our study area. I and mean, they'll basically be clipped to the study area dimensions, which essentially just changes the size of the GIF itself. And you can kind of play around with this, pick whatever works best for you uh, here in line 152. And in line 153, we select the frames per second. And so this is how quickly the GIF um, will tick through all of the different uh, images it's given. 
So for our purposes, we're interested in a, a quick GIF that will show two frames per second. So this is two maps shown per second within the GIF. And then for the format, we're just establishing it as GIF. So to label our images, which is why we called in that package, we're going to go ahead and uncomment lines 158 to 164. And we're going to establish the variable annotations. Um, and this is basically just so that we can include text um, on each of the images that the GIF will tick through, um, basically just providing year. So that year text will exist in position bottom, which basically just means that it'll be at the bottom of the GIF. Um, and you can play around with offset and margin um, to decide exactly what the placement of that text is uh, per image within the GIF. Um, we've just included some presets here. And then this is the property that you're using to annotate, which is year. So you'll remember that we created uh, that property within each of um, our EVI images, and we'll use that property to uh, display uh, your information on uh, each of the images that the GIF will go through. And then for the scale, um, this is just a, a basic uh, scaling section that you can also kind of tool around with. It changes um, some of the size and positioning of, of the text that you're interested in including. All right. So with that, we'll go ahead and map all of these parameters and functions that we've established um, for our GIF um, over our time series. So go ahead and uncomment lines 168 to 169. And we're going to create the variable time series GIF, which will basically um, be us using that EVI with year collection, um, which essentially is just our EVI image collection, but with this new uh, year property. And then we're going to map our function over it, which is essentially the text function that we've um, imported from the package as well as defined with the parameters um, of our EVI maps as well as our study area, um, also selecting for those annotations that we want. And so it's important to note that uh, this uh, annotate image function is uh, written by the, the provider of this package. Um, so we're essentially calling that package, which we established way at the beginning of our GIF code. Right. Oops. Here we go right here in line 137. Um, this is just us calling on the package that we've imported with var, dot, sorry, with var text. Okay, so back to line 169. And so with that function, we're then mapping those annotations over each of our GIF images. Okay, and we'll go ahead and print, print the GIF URL to the console. And basically what this does is um, select for our time series GIF, uh, the dot get video thumb URL um, basically calls it as a GIF image, and then we'll use our GIF params uh, variable to establish the parameters of that GIF. And so this will spit out a URL at us, um, but we also want to render that GIF in the console. So in line 176, go ahead and uncomment, and we'll print um, a UI thumbnail of our time series GIF. Uh, with GIF parameters. So let's go ahead and run that. I'll scroll down to everything that we printed um, in the console. It'll take a little while for the thumbnail to generate. Um, and as you can see, it's taking the, the maps a little bit of time as well. Keep in mind, we're doing a lot of processing here, so these things are going to take a little bit of time. And so we'll give that a second. There we go. And so here you can see our GIF displaying each of our EVI maps uh, from 2014 to 2020, noting change in specific areas. And that's just a really cool way to, to display some of your time series maps. You can also click on this link here that we printed, and it will give you your GIF in another window. And one really nice thing about this too is that you can just right click and then save image as. And when you save image as, make sure you're just saving it as a GIF image, and then you'll have the GIF just downloaded on your computer for use kind of anywhere you need it. 
Okay. So now that we've gone through some of our, our visualizations of uh, time series, we're going to move on to uh, the image differencing uh, that we discussed earlier um, for change detection. So we're going to start off with a simple image difference between uh, 2020, sorry, 20, 2014 and 2020. So uncomment line 179. And so for this, we're creating the variable simple image diff, um, which equals um, our year 2014 EVI uh, subtracted by year 2020. And this is one of the mathematical operators within Google Earth Engine, uh, dot subtract. Um, so we just use that pretty easily um, to subtract the 2020 image uh, from the 2014 image. And this is just uh, subtracting that EVI band. And so we'll go ahead and establish our visualization parameters for that. So we'll start with var diff params, um, where we establish a min, a max, as well as a palette. We're going to keep it pretty simple here again uh, with green, yellow, and red. And then we're going to add the map layer to the map using the map.add layer function. So we're mapping simple image difference, applying the difference parameters, um, and then just titling it here, 2014-2020 image difference. And so we're not going to quite hit run yet. Um, we're going to go ahead and uncomment lines uh, 185 through 188. And in line one, 185, we're going to establish uh, the year mean, uh, which is us calculating a mean over uh, the entire EVI collection. So basically what we're doing here is calling in the EVI collection and then just using dot mean uh, with empty parentheses um, to reduce the entire EVI collection uh, to a mean, which will result in a mean EVI image uh, labeled Y mean. And so line 186, we'll establish the variable average image diff, um, which is going to allow us to subtract 2020 um, from the mean of all the years put together. So this is another interesting way to look at change detection, looking at how um, one year differs from the average of all of your time series. Um, and it can be a really good, interesting way to detect change. I would also mention that you'd probably want like a few more years than we have here. Um, we're just showing you how some of these functions work in a simplistic way. Um, but kind of the more years you can have in your, in your average of whatever parameter you're looking at, the better. So in line 188, we're just going to add that to the map as well. Um, so that's our average image difference with the difference parameters. Um, and we're going to title that uh, 2020 difference from average. So we'll go ahead and run these. At this point, we're, we're asking Google Earth Engine to do quite a bit of processing. So um, don't be afraid if things take a little bit longer. All right. I'm just going to really quickly turn off these geometry points in the viewer. All right, so you can see here we have first our difference from average, but first we're going to take a look at the 2014-2020 image difference, and we're going to zoom in to look at areas of change in EVI between 2014 and 2020. So it's important to note that when you zoom in and out, that's going to cause um, each of the layers to reload um, and sometimes recalculate, um, so it might take a little bit of time um, we can actually go ahead and take these off so they're not taking up any of the processing power. Awesome. So this first difference image is just our difference uh, from 2014 to 2020. And you can see here um, areas in red typically account for differences um, that indicate a decrease in EVI, whereas uh, the opposite is true for green, I believe. So we can see here various uh, locations of change uh, throughout the map. Um, they're not quite as drastic as you might expect if you were just doing a visual inspection. Um, so it's really good to do this kind of image differencing to get a better perspective on actual change. And then we'll go ahead and look at our 2020 difference from average image. So this is just the difference of our 2020 EVI um, from an average of all of the EVIs from 2014 um, to 2020. 
you can see it varies even less from the average and there's less change from that average as well which we would kind of expect um, when looking at an average as opposed to a single date and you can kind of zoom around look at these areas of change um, and do some exploring of these data layers yourself as well and so for the last thing that we're going to do I know we're running up close on time um, we're going to complete one more um, type of change detection uh, visualization. Um, so go ahead and uncomment lines 192 to 202. And so what we're doing here is a standard anomalies analysis or a z-score anomaly analysis. Um, and the first thing that we have to do for that is calculate the standard deviation across the EVI collection because that's one of the other um, pieces we're going to need to calculate uh, this z-score. So you'll note here um, I've, I've included the formula for the z-score. It's a single year uh, minus the mean of all the years and then divided by the standard deviation of all the years. And so this is a really valuable way of looking at anomaly analysis because uh, the value of a of the z-score or the standard anomaly um, can tell you how many standard deviations you are away from the mean. And if a z-score is equal to zero, um, it's on the mean. A positive z-score indicates uh, that the raw score is higher than the mean average, and a negative z-score reveals the raw score is below the mean average. So this tells you how your change varies from the mean, whether it's the value is higher than the mean or lower than the mean. So we'll go ahead and start in line 192 with var standard image which is where we'll just calculate um, the standard deviation. And we're basically using these functions here, uh, calling in the EVI collection, and then reducing by standard deviation to calculate our standard deviation. And then in line 193, um, I've labeled this as anomaly 2020. Um, and I've included um, these variables at two year time steps. So we're starting at 2014 here on line 196. Um, and then going to 2016, 2018, and 2020. And so if you look at the mathematical operators in line 193, you can see that we're subtracting the 2020 image EBI uh, by the mean of all the years put together, and then we're dividing by the standard deviation of all of the images. And so we complete this calculation. Um, three more times in 194, uh, 195, and 196 uh, for different years. And then we can go ahead and uh, visualize uh, this type of uh, anomaly analysis um, on our maps. So we start with 198, establishing the parameters that we want to use um, to map these. We have a min and a max, um, and we've kept the palette um, simple once again with just red, yellow, and green. Um, red would typically indicate uh, negative change, yellow would be closeness to uh, say the zero or closeness to the mean, and green is higher than um, that mean value. And then we'll use the map.addLayer function to add each of these um, anomaly analyses for uh, 2014 to 2020. And we do this um, by calling each of the variables that we've established up here uh, previously. Um, using our anom params uh, that we've established in line 198, and then just naming each layer uh, 2020 anomaly, 2018 anomaly, and, and kind of so forth. So we'll go ahead and run that. And like I did before, I'm probably going to click off some of these EVI images just to make the loading a little bit easier. Let's do this. There we go. So we have our anomaly images from 2014 to 2020. And basically what these are showing is variation from the mean of all of the images in EVI um, per each of the years we've selected. So you'll note that uh, there's anomalies throughout 2014. It varies from the mean. It's usually uh, more positive in terms of EVI, it looks like, which would indicate that it has 
vegetation presence at these green areas that might not exist uh, quite so much in the uh, mean image. And then as we click through, we can see how this changes per year. 2016 has quite a bit of variation from the mean. Um, remember that that variation is represented by the red and the green. And then 2018, a little bit less variation than, than 2016 from the mean. And then 2020, quite a bit of variation from the mean. And so we can also compare this to say uh, our 2020 EVI map. So if we wanna take a look at the 2020 anomaly and how that matches up with the measure of EVI in this area, we can do some interesting overlays that can show us areas that may have uh, been degraded or had decreases in EVI um, solely in 2020 as opposed to um, in other years. So this can be a really good way to examine um, the location of change, um, the amount of that change as well. Um, we have a static number of pixels within each of these um, differenced images within all of our anomaly analysis. Um, and so I hope that that is a good intro into visualizing change detection um, for you in uh, GEE using mostly uh, mathematical operators, um, image differencing, um, and ways of just looking at variation like we did here with um, our, our Z-score anomaly analysis. And with that, um, that kind of wraps up our code demo. I hope that you were able to follow along. I hope that some of this was helpful. Um, we know that this is a little bit of a simple example, just using one band of a vegetation index, um, but we were hoping that that would uh, allow you to, to follow along better with all of the different things that we've done within the code uh, because we created our uh, vegetation map, our EVI maps, we created um, anomaly maps, difference to image maps. Um, we showed you how to plot a time series of a single pixel in a chart. Um, and then we also showed you how to create that GIF um, for communicating some of your time series analysis as well. So hopefully you all found this helpful um, and we'll go ahead and uh, transition back to the slides for finishing off the session. Okay, um, so now that we've finished our activity, let's go over a quick summary of what we learned today. To start with, uh, we went over time series analysis, explaining why creating a time series of satellite data over a number of uh, dates, weeks, months, seasons, and years um, is effective in monitoring landscape change. And we examined the implementation of change detection to identify gradual and abrupt changes in the landscape. In our activity, we saw how GEE can be used as kind of an all-in-one platform for filtering and compiling large data sets at various time steps, time steps um, completing raster calculations and visualizing data. So during our code walkthrough, uh, we completed a simple time series analysis by calculating a vegetation index across a collection of images compiled annually, um, showing our results um, within the GEE interface. And we also completed a change detection analysis uh, using visual inspection methods and image differencing techniques. So for those interested in a certificate of completion for this series, uh, there's one homework assignment. Answers must be submitted via Google Form, which can be accessed from the training page on the RSET website. And the due date for the homework assignments is July 14th. So this is two weeks uh, after the close of the webinar series. A certificate of completion will be awarded to those who one, attend all of the live webinars and two, complete the homework assignment uh, by the deadline of July 14th. Um, and you'll receive a certificate approximately two months after the completion of the course um, from Marinus Martins. And here's our contact info again, uh, just in case you have any questions about today's session, uh, that we're not able to cover in the Q&A. And we've also provided links to the training page, uh, the RSET website, um, and to our social media. And we really encourage you to follow us on Twitter to stay informed about upcoming trainings and events. And with that, I just wanna thank all of you for joining us for this series. Um, we really hope that you were able to attend all of the sessions, um, and we would love your feedback on future GEE trainings uh, that you might be interested in. And once again, I also want to thank Brittany Beaudry uh, from the NASA Develop Program for all her contributions to the series. Um, and I also want to thank John Dilger from the Spatial Informatics Group and Abigail Berenblit from NASA Goddard 
um, who helped us with our JavaScript API activities. And so now we'll go ahead and move on to our Q&A session. All right, hello everyone. Um, let's go ahead and get started with questions. Um, we'll wait a second to, to screen mirror the Q&A doc, perfect. Awesome. So we're also joined by uh, Abigail Barenblit and John Dilger. So Abigail, John, if uh, you'd like to contribute to any of these answers, please feel free to just jump in um, and I'll probably have some of my own questions for you as we go through this Q&A doc. I mean, you'll know we, we don't have too much time for questions, but we're gonna try and answer questions for the, the next 30 minutes or so. Um, so let's just go ahead and jump right in. So question one, could you please uh, better explore the differences between linear regression reducer types uh, applied over image collections. Do they provide different results? Uh, slope bearer values, uh, error band, for example, uh, things like that. Um, so essentially, if you use a different reducer, um, you're gonna get a different result. And choosing a reducer depends on the statistical needs of your project. Um, so it's really kind of up to you as to how you reduce. Um, within our examples, we were mostly using reducers as a way to average um, or provide a median. Um, so you might have some other needs with your own uh, work. Um, so just definitely take a look at this GEE developer page uh, that we've linked here. Um, it goes into detail about reducers and there's also a link on that page that will take you um, to specific information about regression reducers, uh, which you seem to be pretty interested in. Okay, question two. Is there any quota or limit for computing power per GEE user? And how long may analyses like the one on slide 11 take to process uh, on Google Earth Engine? Um, so there is a user limit for processing on Google Earth Engine. Um, and you'll receive an error if you've reached this limit. It'll pop up right in your console. Um, and processing time in Google Earth Engine is usually much quicker um, than that of your own computer. Um, it can, it can't necessarily, I can't necessarily speak to the time it would take for a, a project like the one on slide 11 to process, um, but I wouldn't imagine processing time uh, per land cover map uh, would vary that much from, say, our land cover example in the last session, um, just given the size of that study area. Um, however, I think the, the whole time series might take a while to process. Um, and in any uh, case like this, like if you're reaching that memory limit error, um, you might just need to run the classification a, a year or a few years at a time. Um, to avoid any of those processing memory limits. Um, and, and kind of with anything that you're trying to uh, process or export, um, you can always just kind of split up uh, the, the various steps of your analysis just to not reach that uh, memory limit or receive that error. All right, question three. How do we harmonize the analysis uh, when using say a combination of Landsat 5 and 8 in a time series analysis. Um, so there is in fact a method for harmonizing data from different sensors in the Landsat series uh, using Google Earth Engine. And this is usually seen as like an ETM plus uh, to OLI uh, harmonization. That's the example that's provided by the GEE developers. Um, and so I provided a link here to how they do that um, within a tutorial. So I would say rather than me telling you exactly how that works, um, you could definitely just follow this tutorial link and, um, and see how the GE developers would recommend you do something like that. All right, so question four. Uh, the graph showing 1986 values of NDVI, which data set is used to get uh, for 1986 NDVI values? So I believe you're referring to um, the fire plot that was on uh, the slide where we were talking about uh, gradual versus abrupt changes. Um, and so in this case, uh, the data comes from Landsat and NDVI. Um, and the one important thing to note is that there is 30 meter uh, Landsat data going all the way back to 1982. Um, so that's why you're seeing such a large time series here. Um, the fire event in question in that case happened, I believe in uh, 1988. So it looks like they used some data from before the fire event and then did the full time series plotting all the way to forest recovery. All right. Question five. How do you conduct multi-date land cover classification in Google Earth Engine for land cover change detection? Uh, do you need training data for each of these dates? 
And I think Abigail, you might have answered this question if you'd like to, to take it away. Yeah, I can chime in. Um, so if you're trying to run a classification for two different years or a few different years, you do need individual training data for each of those dates. Um, however, if you're trying to compare um, a start date and an end date and then look at trends in between, there are methods for integrating tools like LandRunner, um, and that can help automate your classification. So I've included links to two papers. Um, it's code that I haven't worked through myself, but these are um, some good resources to start to help figure out that process. Awesome, thanks Abigail. Great, so question number six. Let's see, not sure if this will be covered, but is it possible to show or send a link to code to export the image results? Oh yes. So we did actually go through this today with our export function. I'm mean, if you'll remember, we actually only um, exported a segment of our total map just because of that memory timeout that we mentioned um, previously in some of our questions. <clears throat> but once you complete that export, um, we usually do like an export to drive. Um, and that's just a place where then we're able to, to download that TIFF. Um, once you have that TIFF on your computer, you can use that in any desktop GIS that you're interested in, like QGIS Envy, like you mentioned, in, and ArcGIS as well. And the, the default for an export in um, Google Earth Engine is going to be a GeoTIFF file, um, which are uh, some of the easiest files to work with in desktop GIS. All right, question seven. Is it possible to demonstrate an NDVI chart for big area changes over the years? So yes, um, I, I provided a link here um, from slide 16, which if you'll remember, that was the MODIS NDVI uh, line chart example that we gave. Um, so you can take a look at that uh, page yourself. And then for any areas that you're interested in kind of getting, say like an average time series of, so say you have a certain plot that you would like an average NDVI for, um, you can actually use the, the process that we, um, used within our activity today, um, but just replace your um, geometry from a point to a polygon, and then that chart will just display an average over the pixels within that polygon. And we'll talk about that a little bit later as well, because I think another question asked, uh, uh, asked that more specifically. Okay, question eight. Could you recommend methods for object-based change detection as opposed to pixel-based change detection. So obviously you'll note that within this uh, <laughs> within this series, we kind of favored that pixel-based approach, um, but if you're interested in object-based change detection or even object-based uh, land classification, a really good place to start with this is going to be uh, the object-based methods page on the GEE website. So I've provided that link there. And then uh, Abigail, John, I don't know if you have any other comments on this, if you've if you've done any object-based analysis in GEE. Okay. I don't, yeah, I don't have much to add, sorry. <laughs> awesome, no, that's okay. Just wanted to check. Yeah, I think we, we tend to favor that pixel-based approach just because it um, gives us a little bit more fine scale picture of what change is happening. Okay, question nine. Is it possible to set a seed within GEE for analysis involving random components uh, that you would like to repeat exactly. Um, so I think uh, with this question, what you're asking about is uh, some of the random sampling that happens within uh, the the within GEE. Maybe this is for uh, last session potentially. Um, I think in this case, uh, we'd probably want you to email us just to to get a little bit more into what your question is. Um, but I think one thing to note is that when you're looking for um, a random selection of say data points or a random selection of say decision trees or something like that um, that's something that google earth engine is going to do on a case-by-case -case basis um, if you want the same uh repeat say the same repeat in the seeds as well i don't actually know um, how you might be able to do that so we can take a closer look at that um, unless anybody else would like to to add to that hey zach yeah i have yeah. a question or i have an answer for that awesome so if you're running um like any of the sort of classifications like random forests like that there is a parameter for a seed 
Um, so you can set that to you know whatever number you want. And then if as long as you're using that same number, um, you know it, it should repeat exactly the same. Uh, if you leave it blank, then it will, I think, just define a random seed, and then you'll always get different results. But yeah, you can set a seed um, for certain, if not all, classifiers. I know you can for random forest. Okay, awesome. Thanks, John. All right. So question 10, how do you use multiple data sets to create your image collection? I mean, Abigail, I think you took this answer. I did. So there are a couple different methods. So say you want to um, use a median image, so a mosaic image that you've already created, you can use eimage.cat, which will concatenate those composites. So in the past, I've used this to concatenate a Landsat composite and a Sentinel composite for a random forest classification. Um, and then there's also merge if you're trying to merge image collections. So for example, when you're harmonizing uh, a few different Landsat sensors, um, this is the type of code you would use, just e.imageCollection and then within those parentheses, uh, a few different versions of merge. Awesome, thanks, Abigail. All right, question 11. What does it mean when it says this asset is deprecated when you hover over the Landsat name? So unfortunately, um, with, with uh, the Google Earth Engine data catalog updating um, as quickly as it does, um, new data sets are always coming out, um, especially with Landsat, um, as they keep up with some of the processing standards from USGS. Um, so a new Landsat data set just came out. Um, so future support for the Landsat data set that we used here um, won't necessarily be happening. So deprecated just means that there is uh, essentially a, a newer data set that will be supported in the future um, that you should likely transition over to. Um, this just recently happened. Um, I just saw a, a tweet today from a colleague uh, mentioning that everyone should potentially update their um, call-ins of Landsat imagery into Google Earth Engine. Um, so we just weren't necessarily able to incorporate that into this activity. Um, but fortunately, that doesn't make a huge difference in the code that we went over. Um, you'll still be able to use the, the deprecated data set like we have um, here. And that's still uh, Landsat surface reflectance data, um, which works well for our purposes. Um, and the only things that you'll need to change if you want to use the uh, new Landsat uh, level two surface reflectance data product from collection two, which I've provided a link for here, is to just change um, the image collection that you're importing at the very beginning of the code, uh, that name of the image collection that you import. And then you'll also just wanna update um, the names of your bands that you're using uh, within the code, and then um, just the cloud, cloud shadow bit masking. Um, so there's not a whole lot to update with incorporating a new, a new data set like that because it's still Landsat data, um, but that's just something important to keep in mind. So good catch. All right, question 12. How do you know when to divide by 10,000 to scale for reflectance? Do you ever need to divide by a different number? What does it mean to scale for reflectance? And Abigail, I think you also took this one. Yes, I did. Um, so it depends on the sensor, and you can find the information about how to scale it on um, usually whichever um, government organization or, or mission the sensor is associated with. So for example, for Landsat, I've included a link for where you would find the information on the proper um, scaling to for reflectance. And essentially when we're scaling for reflectance, it's scaling the data set to absolute units and that allows for um, direct comparison to other data sets. Can I, can I add something also, to that as well? Oh yeah, go for yeah, it. Yeah, please. Um, also, uh, uh, the images in Earth Engine are scaled differently for processing reasons, I imagine. Uh, so anytime you have an image collection for like Landsat or Sentinel-2, uh, if you search it in the search bar, you can look at the properties for each band. And if there's a scaling factor on it, it should be reported there as well. Awesome, thanks, John. 
Great, question 13. Is the step list function acting um, analogous to a for loop, uh, like years 2014 to 2020, uh, to do this for every year? Um, so this is actually something that uh, John helped us with, uh, basically assigning uh, years to each of our images within an image collection. Um, so John, if you would like to take this as well, I I'll turn it over to you. Sorry, I muted myself. Yeah, you can think of it as a for loop. Uh, you know, in, in functionality, it is a for loop. Um, but it's it's different in that it uses um, mapping, a mapping function on it, which is um, scalable across for uh, and works in Earth Engine. Um, Essentially, I mean, word of warning, don't use traditional for loops in Earth Engine. Um, they don't work very well and typically break. Um, but you can think of mapping as a for loop. So it's essentially just saying for every item in a list, do something. Did that answer the question? Yeah, I think that's great. Thanks for answering that. Awesome. So question 14, in line 28, for the function year, where did year come from? How do I find where the variable is defined? Um, so if I wanted to filter by something else, such as month, uh, where would I go to find those options there? Um, I need to go back and take a look at that in the code real quick, just to see what you're referring to. Mm, filter by year. Yeah, so in, in line 28, basically what that that year is referring to is just um, the any year within that image collection. So in, in this case, we were really interested in filtering for filtering our data from uh, May 1st to September 15th um, for each of our years. Um, so rather than giving like a specific year there um, for our, our start date and end date filters, um, we just put year there, which just indicates every year uh, between those. Uh, months and dates, I believe. Okay. So question 15. Is it possible to plot a chart with multiple data sets? Uh, for example, different precipitation products on the same chart? Um, so yes, um, it, in the cases that I'm aware of, you would essentially just be plotting multiple bands uh, from an image collection. Um, so an example of that can be found uh, here on this image collection charts page that I got from the, the Google developers website. Um, and so in that case, similar to how we um, charted for our EVI band, you can add multiple bands to any line uh, chart that you're interested in creating. All right, question 16. Is there a way to control the resolution of output images in the image collection um, from within the functions? So yes, there is. I think a, a good place to start is looking at some of the scaling information from Google Earth Engine. Um, but in the case of exporting an image, uh, you can basically just adjust that scale line that we had. So for example, in line 112 of our code in the activity, you could just change the scale uh, to something other than 30. Um, to scale the exported image differently, kind of to your specifications. And then when you do say like an export or anything like that, um, there's also the option to change the scaling there. And then in terms of other types of scaling, Abigail and John, if you have any thoughts on that, feel free. So just to tack onto that, the idea of scale with engine is kind of uh, nebulous, if you will. Um, so if you're looking at an image in like the, the it, it is adjusting the scale as you zoom in and zoom out. So you can see, you know, you might see like strange artifacts or uh, different values will show up, will not show up, but like uh, it will be visualized differently based on your zoom level. Um, but when you export it, as long as you, whatever you define your scale as, is what it will be exported and computed at. Um, so just something something to know. 
um, yeah, there there's definitely a way to define a set scale in Earth Engine. Um, but typically, typically you would only want to do that if you're just checking to make sure, um, you know, your images are working the way you want them to at the scale you're, you'll export. Because if you set set it to like 30 meter resolution and zoom out, uh, you know, to the entire world, you'll get a, a memory error because that's a lot of pixels. Awesome, thanks, John. Okay, so question 17. I hope that we were able to answer this for you uh, during the session, uh, but if not, the question was, is there an undo? I accidentally just erased five lines of code. Um, so yes, there is. If you end up accidentally erasing any, any lines of your code, you can always just hit Control Z um, on Windows and then Command Z on Mac to undo. It's kind of similar to other um, platforms or, or softwares that you might be familiar with. Um, so in that case, yes, definitely just um, hit the Control Z or Command Z depending on your machine to do that undo. Okay, question 18. Is there a citable reference slash background publication for this methodology that is being presented? So unfortunately, there's not a specific background publication for this methodology. Um, this activity is honestly just a, a compilation of techniques and functions meant to give you a really broad overview of how to manipulate um, data within Google Earth Engine. Um, so we got into a lot of functions within the code uh, to show you basically what's possible within Earth Engine especially as it relates to, to time series analysis and change detection. Um, but you should really always make sure that you're doing your own research um, when you're completing analysis um, to see what works best um, for your study system and also what's most scientifically sound uh, for your purposes, because this definitely isn't kind of like a one size fits all methodology for sure. Um, this is just us showing you some techniques that you might find useful in your own work. Um, and I've provided a couple of example publications um, used when creating this code. Um, and uh, you can see them here. One is for EDI, uh, that's the vegetation index that we used, and another is for that standard anomaly calculation. And we also have a citation for the training on the web page, if you're interested in citing that more specifically. Awesome. So question 19. Can you not just clip the entire collection at once instead of year by year? And Abigail, I think you took this answer, so feel free to go ahead. Yeah, and um, hopefully I understood their question correctly. Um, yeah, before you mosaic um, your image collection into an image, you can use filter bounds, and that will bound the entire collection to a certain area. Um, depending on the data you're working with, it may not match exactly with your study area. That's why clip is kind of nice, um, but it, it's kind of like you you use either of these commands depending on if you're using an image collection or an image. Um, so hopefully that that answers the question. Um, and uh, John or Zach, feel free to add anything to that. Yeah, I think that that's a great answer to that. Thanks, Abigail. Or John, did you want to say something? Yeah. Uh, yeah, just real quick, I, I'm about to hop off. Uh, that's exactly correct. And I, I would just mention that clipping images is a sort of computationally expensive um, function to run. So ideally, you know, you only want to try to clip your image uh, once, <laughs> uh, at, typically at the end of your process. So like, it's easier, it's easier and more beneficial to just run your analysis on like your image collection that's been filtered and then clip it once at the end to visualize it or just for exporting. Um, and you know, even if you do stuff like you clip every image in your image collection, then do your analysis. Um, in the background, I think most of the time GEE uh, notices that and then moves it to the end. Um, but yeah, that's just a, a performance booster. Awesome. Thanks, John. And thanks so much for joining today and for all yeah, your help. Of course. Love it. 
Um, Zach, I think I took this this next one as well, if you want me to keep going. Yeah, awesome, definitely. Um, so in the code, the part you choose the EVI image for each year's line 60 through 69. Is it easier to do this in a loop or is it not possible? I have more than 30 years of images. It will be complicated to write this for each year. So um, as mentioned before, Earth Engine doesn't really have loops per se. So what I would do here is write a function that adds the year of data collection as a band to the collection. Um, and then for each image that's included in that collection, you'll just have the year. Uh, then you would write an additional function or maybe as part of a larger function um, that would calculate the median or mean EVI for that year. Um, and this is something that you could export. Um, you could uh, filter this into a table um, and get the information that way. So that would be another, another option. That's a great suggestion, Abigail. Thank you. All right, question 21. Is it possible to export the image collection, all the images uh, that are part of the time series at the same time? Um, so you could try exporting the image collection, um, but there's a high likelihood that you would exceed the user memory limit for the export function itself. Um, so if you run into this issue at any time, it's kind of similar to, to what we've discussed before. You can always just separate your exports into sections to download them incrementally. Um, and that's just something to keep in mind. Like, uh, I think a lot of people like to use Google Earth Engine as a way to filter their imagery, to access imagery. Um, it's a, a little bit easier than some of the platforms that exist. Um, and I think it's also important to note that in the case that you're just looking for a, a series of images within an image collection, really kind of just splitting up that export um, doesn't necessarily uh, matter for the end result of uh, your uh, imagery collection um, that you can then ultimately use in whatever type of GIS you're interested in using after that. All right, question 22. Where is the legend? Why not use different colors to show different features more clearly rather than just different shades of green? Or is this possible? So uh, we went over coding a legend uh, in the interface last session. Um, it's quite a bit of code, so we didn't include it um, in this session for time reasons. As you can see, we we kind of really pushed the the timing on the, the code session of, uh, of this section of the training. Um, however, uh, you could also look back at uh, session two, two to see how this was done, basically just coding a legend into the user interface for you to look at. Um, in this case, we used such a simple color scale, partially for this reason, um, so that we could just interpret changes on our maps um, a little bit more easily. Um, and that was purely for visualization reasons. Um, and you can uh, play around with more complex color palettes in your own work. Um, and for our purposes, this was just a, a more basic example, so we really tried to keep it simple. Um, and another good example of implementing a more complex color scale is within that, that session two training um, where we provided that legend for our land classification. All right, question 23. When displaying each layer, like you did with each year of EVI, are the layers overlapping so that you can see the actual overlap? Okay, so I think that first question kind of gets at what question 23 was um, trying to explain. Um, so basically the short answer to this is that uh, the layers that you have checked on Google Earth Engine, uh, the one at the top that is checked is going to be the only layer that displays um, within your map viewer. The others will be layered underneath it. Um, it's not like an additive process of including changes over time on a single map. Um, it's just each of those single images layered one on top of the other, but you can adjust the transparency there to show where some of those changes are or to compare images. And I think question 24 will probably be our last because um, we're already a little bit over on time. Um, but question 24 is, in GEE, how can we create line charts of time series over polygon slash areas um, or lines rather than points? So um, I think I mentioned this a little bit earlier, um, but if you want to use a, a polygon or a line um, for uh, the, the line chart creation, you can always just create another geometry kind of on top of everything that we had already done within this activity. Um, so you can use those geometry tools that we, we took a look at today 
um, to either draw, say, a, a rectangle, uh, you could create your own polygon, you can create a line, um, and then you just replace uh, the geometries in uh, lines 120 and 128, where we created both of our charts today, and you would just replace uh, those geometries, RO, I think it was ROI and ROI2, um, you just replace those with your chosen geometry. And so when you do something like a polygon uh, line chart, that's going to take basically an average of all of those pixels within your polygon uh, to then plot uh, that line graph. Awesome. And I think with that, we'll go ahead and uh, wrap things up for our GEE for land monitoring series. Um, and we hope you all got something out of it. Um, if we weren't able to get to your questions today, definitely take a look back at the website once we post the Q&A doc. Um, and also feel free to email us. Um, but thanks all so much for joining um, over the past three weeks. We really appreciate it.